Hi. Uh, welcome to all of you. And uh, I'm Victor Navasky, Delacorte professor here. And this is the first of our Delacorte lecture series. And I'm going to introduce Mr. Gaines in a minute. Um, before I do, uh, I want to say a word about the, the series for this semester. And uh, hope you all come back and tell your fellow students they ought to be here and tell them what they're missing. Um, next week, we're going to have David Remnick, who is the editor of The New Yorker. Uh, the week after that, we're going to have the art director of New York Magazine, Chris Dixon, who's going to talk about the relationship of uh, how to talk to an art director, and the relationship of art to editorial work, and the tensions that arise between those two places. Then we're going to have uh, Adam Pitluck, who sat where you're sitting of just a few years ago, who's a student here, who is now the editor of American Way magazine, which is the magazine of American Airlines. And he wants to sign all of you up to write articles for it. So come with your uh, thoughts on that. And then we're going to have the global editor-in-chief of Reader's Digest, Peggy Northrup. And they've gone through a great revolution. They used to be America's most popular magazine, and they have financial troubles like everyone else, and they're doing interesting things to it. We're going to have the editor-in-chief of Ladies Home Journal, and who's going to talk about not only the magazine, but the website that accompanies it, which one of their people uh, described as the magazine's little sister. And uh, the relationship of magazines to websites is a great subject. And then we're going to have another fellow who sat where you're sitting a few years ago, who now runs Ron Henkoff, who now is the editor of Bloomberg Markets. And, and this is a whole new thing that's happening out there, which we'll tell you about. And then we're going to have Arianna Huffington, who is the co-founder and uh, editor-in-chief of Huffington Post. So it's, you're going to get a panoramic view of what's happening in the business. And uh, and the value, by the way, of all of these uh, extraordinary people who are talking to you, I think, and I think it's going to be true today as well, is one half of what they say to you, but the other half is what you, is on your minds and what you say to them and what you extract from them. You've got this unique opportunity to, uh, if, if you're in the middle of your master's project, to ask questions which will advance it. If you hear something that does not ring true uh, in the formal presentation, you can uh, keep the speaker honest, which won't happen today, I'm sure. And if you are stimulated to take it to the next step to explore what, what is behind, you know, what is by definition, a, a, we're here for a short time. so. Um, so here's the drill today, is that you're going to hear from uh, Jim Gaines, and then uh, he'll join me up here, and we'll have a very brief conversation and turn it over to you. And it's really questions from you, and we've got mics here, and um, we're, we're recording this, uh, and we're also, it's going to be, uh, the video of it will be on CJR's website. And um, so you can tell others that they'll be able to see it then. Um, Jim Gaines is, is it, to me, it's extraordinary, his, his background, because uh, there's nothing quite like it in journalism today. And there never is, as far as I know, been anything quite like it. I, he is a journalist, a magazine editor, a publishing executive, a media consultant, author. And uh, he has started a new business since I first wrote out what he was doing when he was editor-in-chief of FLYP, which is the first multimedia online publication. And he now, as he will tell you about it, is, is, has invented something called Story River Media. But um, it is his past that is as relevant as his present. <laughs> because, as you may gather from the signs around the school, he was the top editor at Time magazine. He was the top editor at Life magazine, which he revived into a weekly, and I hope he 
says something about that, and that was this great picture magazine. And he was the top editor at People magazine. And by the way, he was simultaneously editor and publisher at Life magazine. So uh, his uh, experience in journalism, to me, incarnates what the last 25 years of what's been happening in the magazine business and then some, and then, as you'll see, he's such a young man to have uh, done this. So we're very glad that you were able to join us. And why don't you come up here, Jim, and let's give him a welcome. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for those very kind words, especially young. Um, I had started to write uh, my remarks for today and then decided not to because um, uh, I wanted to talk to you. Uh, you deserve that. You are brave souls for being in the world of magazines these days. And, um, but I confess that I, I forget what it is that I would ask when I was, would have asked when I was your age. Um, so I would ask you to think about that while, we're, while I'm talking and ask me what it is you want to know. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm basing this on the idea that you are mostly concerned with what do I do when I leave here? And because I, I think that's what I would be most concerned about. And, um, and the first thing that I, the first advice that I would give you is ask. Um, the first job I was up for after college in journalism um, was at a weekly newspaper called The Herald, which I later found out people at Newsweek called The Herald. Um, it was a Sunday newspaper being, being run by a guy with his trust fund. And uh, a would-be poet who was the co-editor of the newspaper <coughs> named John, Gregory John Martin Portley. I was very nervous. I wanted to get this job. And, I, and uh, I said to him as I was on my way into the second interview with the owner, I said, do you, think I'm, do you think he's gonna hire me? Do you think I'll get this? And he said, ask him. Just ask him. And, uh, and I did. I asked him to give me the job, and he gave it to me. Um, so I learned that early, and I was very lucky to learn that. Um, I found that people who came to me over the years who asked for something, generally, they weren't scared of what they were asking for. And they were generally ready for what it is, was they were asking for. And, and I was willing to share the risk with them of having put themselves out in asking for it. So I would tell you to ask for what it is you want. Um, the second thing I would say is that you should be lucky. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy, but I'm not that smart. I was very, very lucky. Um, and one of the things that you really need to do is to see your luck in your failures, especially. They won't feel lucky, and they didn't to me either. But the best things that happened to me were the worst things that happened to me, it turned out. And I, don't, and I think that that's generally true. I think it's the, the hard part is when you don't see it. Um, when I, uh, the Gregory John Martin Portley, who gave me the good, good advice that got me my first job, ended up getting into a fist fight with the other co-editor, uh, and the two of them were fired, and I became the editor of the paper. Um, so that's somebody else's failure that was good luck for me. Um, but then the publisher who had been spending his trust fund to start this newspaper confessed to us at a staff meeting that we weren't selling the thousands and thousands of copies that he told us we were selling all this time. We were actually selling more like 100. And we were just completely uh, shaken. Um, we had been working really, really hard, and it had come to nothing. Um, and I quit. I don't think I could have quit had I not found out that he had basically been lying to us all this time. I would have felt loyal to him uh, for giving me that job. Um, but I was sufficiently angry and, betray and feeling betrayed that it got me loose from that job. Uh, another example in which failure can be lucky. 
Uh, so after a couple more jobs, I found my way to Newsweek when Watergate uh, was going on, which tells you how not young I am. But I was a writer in the National Affairs uh, Department during Watergate, and I was very popular at parties because I had really I'd broken the rocks on very difficult subjects that everybody was talking about. And, uh, but I had gone to Newsweek the understanding I was going to take a leave after the 76 presidential election to finish a book that I had under contract for some time that was already overdue. And in the interim, the editor of Nation changed. And the new editor had somebody else in mind for my job. And so he said, I'll let you take a leave, but I'm going to pay you for your leave on the condition that you not come back. And I had been terrified of what I was doing. I felt really good at cocktail parties because of what I was doing. But honestly, the terror of facing the blank page every Thursday night was awful and um, really took a, a toll on me. I remember asking a, a writer at Newsweek, Tom Matthews, does the terror ever go away? And he said, no. Um, but I loved the job. I loved what it, I loved what the job said about me. And when he fired me, um, I had just had a baby. My wife and I had just had a baby. And uh, so it was a very inopportune moment to be fired. Um, and I was really shaken. Um, a few months later, the money from Newsweek had long run out and the book wasn't finished. And I had a wife and child to support. And somebody said I should call Dick Stolle, who was just starting something called People Magazine. And I remember going to a drugstore to buy it. And on the cover, I will never forget, was a cover of Lindsay, Wag Lindsay Bionic Woman Wagner. And the subhead was 500,000 per episode, two suitors, and a case of anemia. And I thought, oh my god. Can I do this? Um, I went in for the interview. I told him I would let him know. And the, the staff was exhausted. They were just clearly, I mean, it was a startup, and, and it was the concept of optimal understaffing was popular then. And they were way understaffed. And um, so I remember I went to cross the street from the Time Life building to Exxon Park, where there are benches and shade trees. And I sat there thinking, what? has it come to. I was writing about the great events of our time, and now it's going to be Lindsay Wagner's anemia. And um, it turned out to be the best thing I did when I took that job. And um, I, I came to really care about people. I came to see what it's sort of hidden virtues were. The thing that, that stopped people from getting any competition for the first 30 years of its existence was what nobody got. The, the competi what the competition never got was that what really sold people was not box office. It wasn't, it wasn't hit records. It wasn't uh, ratings. It was the intimate facts about other human beings. And I was in the sort of human interest news segment of people, so I didn't have to deal with some of the tawdrier celebrity aspects until I became the editor of people when I did have to deal with the tawdrier celebrity, tawdrier celebrity aspects and, and very happily did so, but um, not, to taw not tawdry. Um, but I came to really love that kind of human interest story, and I came to appreciate how many times better it is to be telling stories of policy and, and uh, important events through the people rather than the politics or, or policy questions involved. And, and my, my confidence was restored because I had to write three stories a week instead of one for Newsweek or maybe two. Uh, my muscles tightened as a writer. I got lots of new moves. I learned a tremendous amount, partly because I had a boss who knew more than I did. I will tell you, if, the, if there's one thing that defines a bad job, it's a boss that doesn't know as much as you do. If you have a boss who knows more than you do and is willing to share it, that's a good job, in my view. Um, so People was, uh, 
I, I, I really came to love people. And, um, and when I took over, I, I became, I don't know, famous is way too big a word, but I became known for putting people who nobody had known before on the cover. But people who were in an extraordinary situation that was widely shared. The example that, that comes to mind is a woman named Celia Goldie who was in her 90s. And this was a time when we were talking a lot about decisions we were having to make putting our parents into nursing homes. And the cover billing was, how could my son do this to me? She really did not want to go. Um, but nobody knew who Celia Goldie was. They just knew what the situation was. And she was, you know, he was horrified by what he had to do. She was horrified by what he had to do. It was, but it was a very common family situation. And in my time at People, I used to say, anybody who will tell you the truth could be a great people story. And I, th I think I've met some people who that's not true of, who, who are even too boring, uh, even if they would tell you the truth. <laughs> but, um, but I think it, it mostly um, is true. Um, so one, one of the themes that I have t today is that there are lots of different kinds of journalism out there. And I, I, I don't, I, my experience with journalism schools was cautionary. Uh, in my youth, I, I, in my younger days, I never suggested that people go to journalism school. I do now suggest that people go to journalism school. Um, but the reason I didn't is that um, it seemed to me that they only taught one thing. They only taught, um, not AP, but straight journalism. And they missed a whole world of other kinds of journalism. Um, and also they taught media criticism, which has really, uh, in my experience anyway, media criticism and journalism really have more not in common than they have in common. Um, but um, magazines have DNA, and that DNA is associated with different kinds of journalism. People's human interest journalism obviously uh, works, and the celebrity journalism works. At Life, which I which I was given, I think, because of my human interest bent. Um, the best-selling cover I had when I was there was Abraham Lincoln. Um, it, was a, it was an interesting conjunction of the Civil War series of Ken Burns on PBS and the run-up to the, Gulf, the first Gulf War. Um, and the cover made that connection. But still, you would never imagine Abraham Lincoln selling People magazine. Um, for right reasons. Um, part of the DNA of life was, was news and weakliness. And I was able to, because of the first Persian Gulf War, to take life weekly for a war that was unfortunately short. Um, another example of good news, bad news. Um, I, I was working on the theory that, that life weekly could be restarted the way Nightline started with the, the uh, Iranian hostage crisis, day 41, day 416. Um, that show started with the Iranian hostage crisis as a running commentary on what was going on. And I thought if life could come back as a weekly for the Gulf War and the Gulf War lasted long enough, it could go right from a test into a launch. Um, unfortunately, Saddam fell very quickly and I remember my daughter calling me the morning that he surrendered, saying, I'm so sorry, Dad. Um, and unfor another example of failure in success was that the weekly really succeeded um, and failed because we were in the middle of an advertising recession, and the company was worried that it would cannibalize advertising from people in time and that this was no time to put a competitor in the marketplace. And they were probably right for commercial reasons, although it would never have stopped Henry Luce. I just finished doing a review of Alan Brinkley's new biography of Luce, which I really recommend to you. Um, as I thought about talking here, I, I was reflecting on the fact that Victor would be here and that The Nation and Time, Inc. have had such an interesting <coughs> 
uh, relationship over the years because the nation is, has been much more ideologically consistent than Time, Inc., which has been ideologically incoherent. Um, and one of the interesting points that Brinkley makes in his book about Luce is that Luce himself was ideologically incoherent. Um, he was far less, uh, he was very doctrinaire as a person, <coughs> but in his management of his magazines, he was much less ideologically successful than he would like to have been. Um, and that, uh, the difference between people, time, life, is a reflection of that. The magazines were allowed to go their own way. Um, interestingly, when I, after, after my time in career, I was a consultant in Europe for a long time, for five years. And <coughs> my biggest client was Condé Nast, Condé Nast International. And um, I was part of a new, new magazine experiment there. Um, a committee formed to come up with new magazines for Europe. And when we met to, pr to produce the ideas that we were proposing, um, everybody from Condé Nast came and presented first a market. They presented a market of advertisers and a market of readers that were in close conjunction with each other. And that's the way Condé Nast started Vogue. He said, what kind of audience can I aggregate that an advertiser will want, and around what subject? Um, my, my magazine ideas made no sense to them, because they were thought up in the Time, Inc. way, which was, what kind of magazine do we want to do? And then, can we find a market for it? Um, that's how Luce started magazines. And he had, rather than the ideological bias for which he's so famous. He was so great because of his instincts for what magazines could work and why they could work and who should work with them. He, he put amazing people in place. I was just talking to, to Victor about if he were so ideologically pure, how could he have picked Dwight McDonald and Diego Rivera to found Fortune magazine with him? I mean, it was exactly miscast for the kind of for the kind of economic philosophy that he's famous for. Uh, and they had big arguments, and Dwight McDonald went to the nation to write about his problems with Henry Luce eventually. Um, so magazines have DNA, company, magazine companies have DNA, and, and we are far from knowing what that, the, that those DNA properties are going to throw up in the world that we're coming to. Um, I, I kind of buried the lead um, that I'm starting Story River Media, and I will come back to that because I still have to cover time a little bit, and actually life a little bit. But um, the fact is nobody knows anything about where we are right now, which is not comforting, I'm sure, but it is very exciting. And the next Henry Luce is sitting in an audience very much like this one, or playing Warcraft in his bedroom somewhere. Um, it's just going to be a completely different landscape. And really, the reason I'm starting Story River Media is just as an excuse, kind of, to stay at the head of the digital technology and software so that when things start to settle down a little bit, um, at least the tools will be there uh, to start something that will make some sense. Flip Media, which I was at before, was a, was a bi-weekly general interest magazine. Made a lot more sense um, uh, 20 years ago in terms of content than it does today. Nobody thinks about gen general interest on the web is an, act, is an oxymoron, and, and bi-weekly is lunatic. Um, so, but back to life. Speaking of DNA. Um, Life and time covered the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, in entirely different ways. Um, my most vivid memory, and I have a colleague from the Weekly Life here in the front row, my most vivid memory is of a picture that Tony O'Brien took. Um, he and Ed Barnes were in no man's land, basically. They were where they were not supposed to be when some Iranian, Iraqi soldiers uh, surrendered to them. 
Now here's a team from Life magazine, and the Iraqis, this Iraqi unit is surrendering. What do we do with these guys? And I remember very distinctly being in the chart room of the Time Life building, getting the phone call from Iraq saying, we've got prisoners. <laughs> what are we supposed to do with them? But the picture that I remember so well, and the headline was who the enemy was, because it was clear at that point the war was almost over. And it was bare feet. It was their bare feet. It was just from the ankle down across a double truck spread. And it said everything you needed to know about the Iraq war. It said everything you needed to know about Saddam Hussein also. Um, he went to war with the army he had. Um, but that was life. And time at that moment, I was on a task force about time because it was completely bedeviled by 24-hour news, by CNN mainly. The 24-7 news cycle had completely thrown it off its game, n complicated by the fact that the, that the editor wasn't very good and didn't, and didn't have the, he was a really good correspondent and probably, and a very good administrator, but probably miscast to be the editor of Time at that moment. Um, so Time was extremely bedeviled by this CNN problem, and advertising was falling off, and circulation was falling off, and the magazine looked weird, and nobody knew why they were reading it. Uh, it hadn't, it, then it redesigned itself into bitsy stuff in the front and bitsy stuff in the back and some big stories in the middle that you didn't know quite why they were there and weird covers that were based on advertising sales. I remember the week that Magic Johnson announced he had AIDS, time was locked into a cover on California for some advertising reason. Um, so while, the, while, the, while life was going on, I was on this task force about what do we do with time and the reception of life, which was extraordinary, it was emotional. People came to life for, in, in, in times of trial, for some sense of consensual values, where, you know, or orientation, kind of emotional orientation. Um, so everybody thought, you know, maybe, maybe time should be what life was. Maybe we should just you know, move, move that way. And I didn't think so, but I wasn't going to tell them that because they were thinking about making me the editor of Time, which is something I'd always wanted since I got fired from Newsweek. Uh, in fact, the guy who fired me was then the editor of Newsweek, so it was really going to be sweet. Um, the smart, the, the, lots of people thought that I was being brought to Time to sort of peopleize it, make it much more popular. The smart ones thought I would go the other way. Uh, because of my background at people, that I would, you know, I wouldn't allow myself to be outflanked. Um, and that's what, and, and, and they were right. I mean, I, 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 it wasn't because of that, but it was because I actually believed in the DNA that time brought to that moment in history, which was, it's a news magazine. It's about the reporting. It's about summary. It's about it's about doing the big stories of the week and doing them in, a, in an interesting way, which was another part of the DNA of Time, Inc. that Luce brought to it. It's interesting. When he started Time Magazine in 1923, uh, the New York Times was almost intentionally boring. It was written to, be, to seem objective, to seem straight shooting to a fault. And what Luce saw was the opportunity for something that's quicker, funnier, smarter, wit you know, wittier. Um, almost, it, it almost, I mean, he, almost he was the first aggregator, really. He was, he was a person who thought people want it short, they want it fun, they want it interesting. And his model of what they were not going to be was the New York Times. And in fact, in Alan Brinkley's book on Luce, he quotes a Columbia Journalism School professor who said, anybody who tries to insert good writing into a newspaper makes a nuisance of himself. Um, and that's the kind of, when, when I'm talking about different journalisms, 
That's what I mean. I'm talking about, I remember Bill Honan, an editor at the Times whom I'd worked with at Saturday Review, when I, went to, when I told him I was going to Newsweek, said, ah, you're going to use words for cosmetic effect. And I've thought about that ever since, sometimes as, as crap and sometimes as a really interesting uh, observation. Because storytelling is kind of using words for uh, cosmetic effect. You know, you create a narrative arc when you write a story in a storytelling way. That narrative arc didn't happen necessarily in life. It certainly didn't happen in the collapsed span of your story. Um, and so there is some shaping, some more shaping involved in creating narrative storytelling than there is in just telling the news. Um, so that's another way in which there are different journalisms and you have to decide for yourself who you are in order to figure out which kind of journalism it is you want to practice. Um, so going back to time, I, I did intentionally take time in a more serious direction. When Newsweek did Tanya Harding, I did Rwanda. When they did Ro Nolan Ryan, I did Bosnia. And Maynard Parker seemed to have learned something from me at People, uh, and I was glad that he did, because it seemed to me that Newsweek was spreading out in a way that was antithetical to the reason it was created, and the time was, was, was seizing the territory for which it was invented. And we lost the newsstand war to Newsweek for the first time, I think, in Times history when I was there. But we were able to charge more for subscriptions. Um, and profits went up. Newsstand was never meaningful to Time or Newsweek, except in the advertising marketplace, where it had way more importance than it should have had. Um, I'm uh, running to the end here, but um, good news, bad news, one, one more time. Um, time was like the ultimate vindication. It was great. I was competing against the guy who fired me, and I had planes at my disposal, and I was interviewing heads of state, and it was, it was glorious. But it was much less fun than I had had at life or at people. And somebody once said to me, you know, the, the, the older you get, the next job is always less fun than the one before it was, and I found that to be true. Um, time was tough. It was really tough, and it was, um, and it is tough today. Um, finally, uh, don't go to corporate, whatever you do. Um, skip that part. I spent a year in corporate and was really not happy. Uh, I left Time Inc. in 1997 and spent the next uh, decade writing books, narrative history. Uh, story narrative storytelling is really my, that's what I do. That's what I, it ends up, that's what I really love to do. I got over my fear of writing, uh, which had actually been what caused me to become an editor because at least then you don't have to face the blank page. But I found writing very easy, very easy for the last uh, 10 years, or actually more than that, 15 or 20. Um, and so I spent time writing two, two books of, of narrative history, one about, both about the 18th century, one about Europe, one about America. Um, and I'm writing another one now about the 1950s. Um, but what caused me to move back from Europe was a mutual friend wrote me about Flip. And the founder of Flip, Alan Stoga, was looking for an editor. And uh, I remember looking at it and thinking, this is it. I, I really thought I didn't have a role in magazines after you know editing People, Life, and Time. The New Yorker's very well spoken for, so where else do you go? I mean, I. Uh, But when I saw Flip, I thought, this is it. This is what, this is what the future is going to be. I mean, it's not realized there, uh, but it's suggested there. I, I took my kids to uh, Harry Potter. And I remember, I think it was the first movie where the three kids are in the library. And 
they're doing research for something and they pull out a book and they open the book and a face flies out at them. And I just, I was really startled. And um, that's what flip is. That, that's, and I, I thought at, the mo at, at that time, that's how, I, that's how I got what flip does. Um, it takes all of the, it takes all of the cost. I mean, one of the things you learn as a publisher on a magazine is that the cost of magazines is paper, ink, and distribution. And that's really it. Editorial costs are almost dwarfed by that. Um, it takes all those costs away and allows you the, the, to, the, to put amazing arrows in your quiver as a, as a story creator. Audio, video, information graphics, motion graphics, animation. Um, it's sort of like if somebody had come to me when I was at Time and said, you know, we could take, uh, take away the cost of paper and distribution and also let you do video, audio, animation, infographics. Why would I not take that deal? Um, there are lots of good reasons not to take that deal. And, and, that's the re and those reasons are the reasons that major publishers, I believe, will be very late to this because they have to pay attention to their core businesses. They're still very large, at least at Time Inc. and Condé Nast. And the other big com companies have huge vested interests. Um, and one of the things I learned writing about the French Revolution is that large property holders don't make very good revolutionaries. Um, so I suspect that it will be small companies uh, without a hold in, in the print world that are going to figure out what Henry Luce figured out the world needed in 1923. Um, it's not going to be one of the big companies. It's going to be you guys. And I'm trying to become the person who's smart enough to hire the right one of you guys. Um, it's not going to be me. Um, I think that it, it could well be somebody coming out of the world of gaming, because I think that that world, the gaming technology, and the, the, the thing that gets my son to sit in front of his computer all that time has got to be put to an amazing educational use. It's just, it just manifest destiny that, I mean, I imagine trying to do the French Revolution in a game and having you on the streets of Paris on July 14, 1789 with the pamphleteers there and the aristocrats rattling in their coaches over there. That's an experience. And it's something you don't forget. It's not something you have to memorize it's something that gets into you. And so I, I really hope that, that Story River Media and a lot of other companies will stay ahead of all this technology, create jobs for all of you, and create products that are at least some portion as luminous as the ones that Luce created for Time Inc. and that I was lucky enough to edit. So with that, uh, ask. Thank and you. If not now, when? <laughs> Thank you. Good. Why don't you, why don't you come down here and uh, so um, the game that we have to invent is going to, we've got to start a new course here called Magazine Games and we can assign that and whoever comes up with the best Game is I don't. Going to have I don't think no. it's going to be a game, but I think it will be based on right. game technology, right. interaction, and movement. And yeah. I don't know if you saw last night on Frontline. They had a. Uh, did anyone see Frontline last night? It's worth watching. It's. Pardon me. I, I was an intern. I found you were an intern cool. on that program with Rachel Dretson. Yes. Great. Congratulations. Well, it showed the new technology in across the board, and it it covered everything from journalism to uh, a, a spectacular segment on games and how it involved people in this other world and it sort of anticipated Avatar and all of that. But it also had a segment on what the technology was doing to the fighting of wars because war is supposed to be you put yourself at risk and now people are sitting 7,500 miles away from uh, right. the button they press and, and kill it. But, but let me ask about, about the new media and the old in terms of the way it comes to us is first of all business models uh, that, and you say, well, the people who are going to figure it out are small companies and new media. My question is, um, 
we just did a, at CJR, we just did a survey, and we haven't published the results yet, of the relationship of magazine, old magazines, old media, to their websites, digital mm -hmm. media. Right. And one of the findings, and we got 600 responses or something, one of the findings was, no surprise, that in new media, with a lot of exceptions, in digital media, fact-checking is not what it was in old media. In new, digital media, copy editing isn't what it was in the old media. So my question is, um, is the uh, trade-off the uh, inevitable degradation of standards, does that accompany digital media, or is that just a, a temporary thing that's happening and, and when uh, all the things that one talks about here, journalistic ethics and other things, are they gonna be sacrificed in this new world that you're talking about? Um, it's a good question, but I would <clears throat> uh, prefer to, to, re, to, to refocus it because the standards that you're referring to are print standards. Yes. Um, but they're life standards. Yeah. Well, you know, truth. They're, not yeah. they're not, for example, documentary standards. I didn't see right. the front line piece. Um, but we, we don't expect um, I mean, I would hope that the that, that scripts under documentaries would have the same precision, but I don't think they have the same fact-checking standards. Right. Um, nor do they have copy editing standards for obvious reasons. But, um, and I hope that they do have grammatical standards, one hopes, and, uh, but um, I think that, uh, yes, I think standards change as media change. Um, and there are different standards for different media. We, for example, at FLIP did do copy editing on every story. We did do fact checking, but it was selective fact checking. Right. Fact checking when somebody was feeling not fact checking every fact. But I tell you that the fact, a lot of the fact checking that went on at Time Inc. was insane. Right. I, I remember <laughs> having, a, having a people researcher. So there was a line in something that said that Mickey Mouse was up to his knees with awards. And the researcher said, Mickey Mouse doesn't have knees. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, there, were, there were a lot of, there's a lot of wasted right. energy in that process. Right. Um, so yes, I think standards inevitably change as life changes. And, but um, I don't think that I don't think that means the collapse of Western civilization. No, but, but not just fact checking and um, copy editing. Uh, the role of advertisers and advertising in new media seems to be different from the role of advertisers and only in old media. At least lip service was given to the idea of a wall of separation between the two. In new media, people are keeping check of Tra keeping track of traffic in a way that advertisers can glom onto and uh, tell you, you know, it's That's just true. a different That's true. world. I it mean. is a different world. And uh, I think it's up to individual creators to maintain that wall. Um, eventually, it will be up to companies to create that wall. Right now, companies aren't doing a terribly good job of creating that wall or maintaining that wall. But um, it's in advertisers' interests, and they sometimes get it. Right. Um, the business that I'm in is not reliant on advertising. It's going to be client-driven. It's basically a production agency that will do content under contract for people who know who their audience is going to be and who have a story to tell that I am not embarrassed to tell. It may be commercial. It may be non-commercial. Uh, and it will be perp the, the non-commercial part of it will be purpose-driven, the commercial part being to subsidize that. So your uh, business is a storytelling business that I can come to you from The Nation or Columbia Journalism Review correct. and say we need such and such a story, or from 
uh, front line. Right. And you can tell it in pictures, you can tell it on your iPhone. Yeah, exactly. Or you can tell it's it. It's device yeah. complete. We can do okay. pieces for all devices. Right. And we've talked to PBS, and we, we're going to be working with them. Um, we, we have a very robust platform that can do output to all the devices that there are, which is very uncommon. And it isn't something that everybody wants to invest right. in for themselves. Okay. And is this just curiosity, and then I really want you guys to get involved. Is this, um, would you do this for um, McDonald's or Burger King, or only for magazines and journalism and print? And well, uh, I, would, I, I don't expect that McDonald's and Burger King are going to want me to do this. Okay. Uh, well, but The but, gap, I but, don't know. But if they, uh, I don't know. It depends how, how hungry we are at the time. but. Um, but our, our natural targets are, are not even magazines and newspapers, but um, foundations, NGOs, uh, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, uh, the right. State Department, public diplomacy. Okay. There are lots of stories to tell. Good. Okay. So it's another place, though, where the old lines or boundaries are not the way to think about the world. It's, it's, uh, it's breaking them down. And that's true. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. So why don't you why don't you come in? Why don't you use the microphone so we can record your voice with your question? Why don't you? Yeah. Why don't you? We have microphones on both sides, and uh, this is good. So. Hi. Um, Katerina Valdivieso from Digital Media. Um, can you elaborate a, a little bit um, on your business model and the advertisement, because you mentioned that um, paper, ink, and distribu distribution were the biggest cost, um, but you don't, Flip doesn't have that cost. But now I'm learning that you also have partnerships with other media outlets. So how, what's the business model behind it? The, where the, where the money model, come from? The business model is basically work for hire. It's, it's uh, somebody will come to us and say, here's $50,000, please create this, this piece of, this, this story. But I think, Jim, that she's asking about the business model for Flip. Ah, the, the, Flip yeah. didn't have a business yeah. model. That's why it's, okay. it's not going to exist much longer. Uh, uh, it, the problem is that uh, we had an investor who was, who was uh, very generous and allowed us to experiment with digital storytelling, which is what we did. But we never attempted to market it to consumers or to advertisers. We just did it. And it was fun while it lasted. So now what I'm doing is Story River Media is really work for hire. It's clients coming to us, whether from PBS or NBC or anywhere, where they want an uh, a digital analog of some product that, for example, um, uh, the State Department wants to get uh, American curricular materials into foreign educational uh, institutions. That's a, that's a, so rather than send textbooks, uh, we can create multimedia pieces in all languages at once that are instantly available everywhere. Um, uh, Homeland Security, no, not Homeland Security, but the Defense Department wants to teach the kids going to Afghanistan, what is the culture that you're going to be facing? Uh, right now, the Defense Department asks them to read three cups of tea. Uh, surely there's a better way to show them what Afghanistan is like, even though that's a really nice book. Um, showing is better than telling sometimes. Anyway, and uh, so we could do that. I'm not suggesting that we uh, have approached the Defense Department in, or in any way. Uh, PBS has lots of projects for which they are a really good broadcast uh, entity, but for which they are less agile in digital media. And so we, could, we can create not only uh, multimedia adjuncts for programming that they do, but also community-based um, <coughs> Conversation pits, as you, if it, as you, as it were, um, kind of Google Wave-like, 
that, that, that encourage conversations on the local level. And the thing that's great about digital media is how low, the, how deep the layers can be. You know, we can have, if, if we want to have a map that has every city in America on it with detailed information about the water supply or carbon emissions or anything, that is clickable to a database. Uh, if, you know, if we want to have PDFs available to every community outreach program on anything, um, that's easy. And, and that kind of resource is invaluable uh, in terms of the outreach that PBS and NPR need to uh, accommodate their fund, uh, fundraisers, they're not their fundraisers, their funders' interests in, 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 the, in uh, supporting those projects. Thank you. Are there other questions? Let me, this is our f first thing. Let me, yeah, why don't you take the microphone and, and Get up. Hi, my name is Fred Dreyer. I'm a print concentrator. You know, we've read a, a lot of uh, doom and gloom about the magazine industry in the digital age, and I, I was hoping um, you could talk to us maybe about some success stories you've seen in uh, mainstream modern American magazines in the digital age and why you think they've been successful. Well, the week comes to mind, and I think it comes to mind because it was, it serves a need. Uh, it serves the same need that Time was invented in 1923 to do, but Time stopped doing it. Um, you know, honestly, for all the doom and gloom stories about print, there's still a lot of very healthy magazines around. Um, I'm just trying to think of new ones. And the thing is, it's been so scary to start new ones that nobody's done it. Nobody that I can think of, at least off the top of my head. It seemed to be a hundred uh, fewer startups than last year, comparatively. But I think you've got other question here. And while, while you're coming up, I'll say that the, the, the last question was from uh, a student who I'm in a class with. And we, the students sort of voted that the magazine they're going to put out this year is celebrating magazines. And if we hired you to be our editor, told you to put out a magazine to celebrate magazines, what would you, what would you do? Oh, what would your? There's so much great good. magazine journalism. I mean, okay. you'd you'd find the examples of great magazine journalism, and I'd yeah. I'd find ways in which magazines have made a difference. I mean, okay. there's a thing called twenty treatable truths about magazines, which I think the M treatable twenty tweetable tweetable truths. truths. It's ah. on YouTube. Okay. And it, it's a good Got starting it. place for that. Uh, it, the MPA is making itself feel much better. Great. I think they all watch it every day. Um, but uh, I, uh, you know, I'd start with the MPA. They'll tell you amazing stories about about right. magazines. Good. But I, but I'd also start with individuals who've been affected by things that magazines have said. The ways in which magazines have changed their lives, um, and. There are innumerable such stories. I can't name one right now, but um, good. Okay. Hi, I'm Sid. Um, I had a question about. Um, you said you started writing writing again. Um, what do you think is the future of long form narrative as a form of journalism in this digital world? Because I'm a magazine concentrator, and I'm just wondering, what sort of what sort of future does long form journalism hold? When you say you're talking about book length, or you're talking about long form journalism? Long form journalism. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, um, I just don't know. Honestly, the truth is nobody knows anything right now. Uh, Sam Goldwyn said about the, that about the movies, but honestly, I, I don't think it's, I think it's really true. Nobody knows anything. And I believe that long form journalism will be here, but I'm not sure whether that's just because I'm as old as I am or whether that's because it's true. Um, it's hard for me to imagine the nation being the nation, in particular the nation somehow, on the web. And I don't know exactly why, but... It's got a pretty good website, actually. I'm sure it does. Actually, it's got a great website. And, and the fact that all the archives are there for free is a right. wonderful thing for historians. But, um, but I just don't know the answer. 
Yeah, why don't, why don't you take a mic so we can capture your question? Yeah. We're in the multimedia world, no, you, you know, we, yeah. where no, audio is uh, audio is captured. So is Flip Folding as a magazine? Is that what you just said? The f Flip as a magazine has not been is not has been published for a while. It will be um, it will be publishing stories, but I think more on the model that I've been talking about, um, in which it's sort of one-off um, commercial work and journalism that's paid for by the commercial work rather than as a bi-weekly general interest magazine, which is just economically not possible. Yeah. And you, you can line up the mic. And My name is sure. Diego. Um, how much uh, relationship you have with the uh, Reporte Indigo? Uh, they're our parent. They're, they're parent of FLIP. Um, Indigo Media, which was started in Monterrey, Mexico, by Ramon Alberto Garza and a financier by the name of Alfonso Romo um, now publishes seven magazines, I believe, or maybe eight uh, in the multimedia space and um, has just actually gone behind a paywall. Um, and we publish, we have been publishing Flip on the same platform that Indigo uses. And it was Ramon Alberto Garza, he actually uses the Harry Potter moment as the moment when he figured out that he could start something like this. And it was really out of his brain that this platform developed. Um, yeah. And then, and then Hi, my name is Mar. I'm a broadcast concentrator and Stabil, um, which is the investigative program. Um, I'm interested uh, on two things. How do you feel investigative journalism and new platforms as ProPublica or Center for Public Integrity are helping the, that thing you were mentioning about a map that you click and data and you can see like your city and uh, how much do you think that you know that's what's the future of the web? And I, yeah. well, that's my first question then, it's okay. You can answer. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I think we've done work with ProPublica. We did, we did a big piece on, they did a piece on hydrofracking, which is the process by which you bring natural gas out of uh, deep uh, groundwater. And, um, and accommodated uh, and did a lot of infographic work on that story for them, which they ran, they linked to it, to us, and we linked back to them. Um, and then their web people started thinking, you know, we should be doing this. So they've started doing it much more seriously. And they've brought in um, a, a social uh, networking person who's Distributed getting their... Distributed media. I'm sorry? She doesn't want to be called social... Not social media. Uh, citizen, dis citizen. No, distributed media. Distributed media, thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so there, I, think, I think they're on the case. And what about, uh, my follow-up question to that is, what about video and the use of video? Like all these investigative sites are not using video that much, I feel. Um, I, I've, I always ask them this question and they tend to tell me that it is more difficult to produce. And in order to get, a, like, especially for investigative stories, so from your experience doing like a multimedia product, how do you think? I, I just, I don't think it's that difficult. I think that the, the skill set is needed. And sometimes the skill set isn't there on an investigative site. Um, you know, I can tell you, it really isn't that difficult. And, and uh, but it does take a videographer and it takes somebody who knows how to edit it and it takes an audio person and, you know, it does take skill sets. Um, but it, this goes back a little bit to what I was talking about about different kinds of journalisms. Um, I think that you have an affirmative obligation, if you've got a really great investigative story, to engage the audience in it. Not just stick it out there and think, boy, did I do a good job. But to figure out a way to package it, I know package is a funny word, but that you've got to somehow get people by the lapels and drag them through the material in a way that you know, you've got to, this is sort of the, this is the this is the debate between magazine and newspaper journalism, kind of, or at least in my history it was. I don't know if it's that debate anymore, but um, 
I think you have to, it's not enough what you put on the page. What matters is what you put into a reader's head. And I think if you don't do what the media allow in behalf of the material that you've developed, you're, you're betraying the material to a certain extent. I mean, betraying is a big word. I don't mean it that way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm a recent alum, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some examples where this sort of multimedia product is really succeeding. I guess, like you talked to, um, or as you mentioned, sort of nonprofits or government potential there, just sort of where it might really be taking off. I guess I was especially curious because I was helping with um, this academic publisher, and a lot of um, publishers now are creating kind of yeah. uh, auxiliary units. I guess they, they wouldn't want to call them auxiliary, but like right. extra units or labs that have lots of multimedia interactivity, but they're not really being used much. And so sort of where do you see it actually kind of taking off and becoming sustainable? Well, I think the iPad is a step. You know, it makes, it, it makes the device, it, it gets it one step closer to ubiquity and, and functionality that, that could make multimedia more of a reading experience and less of a lean forward utile experience, which encourages engagement, encourages time spent with the material. Um, as long as it's surfing, it's a surfing uh, place, it's difficult to get people to absorb large quantities of information. But when it becomes lean back, as I think the descendants of the tablet will, or the iPad will make it, then I think it's more promising as an educational tool. I mean, the idea of a textbook in multimedia is thrilling to me because you could do so much in terms of engagement. Um, I forget what the question was exactly. Yeah, well, I guess that, I guess, um, sort of, I guess, what, are there sort of successful examples oh. out there, particular fields maybe that where this is succeeding, whether it be journalism or something related? Do you like know Media, where, media Storm? Yeah, actually, when you talked about Story River Media, it sounded quite like it, what they're doing. I, they don't do interactivity. Mm. And they don't do a lot of uh, bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. But I think they succeed very well at, at shaping stories and, uh, and with high production values. Um, um, but honestly, there's not a lot of good stuff out there. Uh -huh. yeah. There's really not. OK. Are there any other questions? Yeah. I, I, I have another one. Could I? OK. We'll take your as the last question. And yeah. Good. Uh, I also wanted to know if you could go more of the nuts and bolts on how do you decide what's the best package and how many, what's the team? Like, yeah. do you do the team work? Is it the same person who does everything? Two, two different people? How, how do you organize right. that? Thanks. I'm glad you asked that, actually, because I've, I've I have found, my experience is that the, uh, that the backpack journalist idea doesn't work. That people, different people are different at different things. And they should follow their hearts into the way, to, to what they're really good at. And also be very conversant with what other people do and how they do it. Not to say that you can just go like this, but, um, but it's definitely a team effort. Uh, the idea comes first, as it does everywhere, and then we all sit around a table, the, 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 the multimedia producer, the reporter, uh, the videographer, the flash animator, the designer. Um, we all sit around a table and say, okay, what is the heart of the story that we're going after, at least pending reporting, pending media development? Uh, we think, what do, how do we see this? Therefore, what media do we go after? How important is audio? How important is, is video? How important is animation? How important is motion graphics, especially infographics, because it has to be developed early? Uh, and then what are the sources for all of those things, and how are we going about getting them? And then when the media come in, we have another meeting where we storyboard. We, we look at everything together. We storyboard the story. The storyboard is just a place to begin. It doesn't run the creative process. Um, the designer goes to work putting a design together. The videographer edits the material, the audio, and the audio. Uh, the flash animator works on a works on an opening or whatever animations may be part of the interactivity, uh, motion graphics as needed, uh, and really the text is kind of the last thing. Um, although the the writers that we get from print generally write the story, 
it's generally nothing like what, what eventually appears because at the top layer in a multimedia digital uh, piece, the text is more like a navigation device than it is like story, like a story. Um, I, I used to think that compression at news magazines was hard. This is unbelievably compressed. It's much more like humming the tune than singing a song. It's, it's, it's extremely compressed. And it's very carefully considered because you can't ask anyone to read much on a screen, at least now. That may change. Um, okay, so we've learned that nobody knows what they're doing, mm -hmm. but that everybody Sorry. has these special skills. And if we get them around a table, we can um, come up with this, the multimedia solution. And all these print people out there, uh, you've just got the last word that you're going to be the last inputter on this thing, and it's not oh, going no, to no, look no, no, like no, what no. you started not with. Not at all. Yeah. No, not no. at all. Not Good. At all. I got the it wrong. Print person is key Good. in the very beginning. Good. Okay. Print person is key in the beginning <laughs> and the end and the middle probably. Exactly. Too. Anyway, yeah. thank you very much. It's been very, it's opened a new world to Good. us. So Good. thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.